You're now watching Global Watch on CGTN now, a CGTN exclusive. Our 12-day live program, New China, comes ahead of the 70th anniversary of the People's Republic of China on October the 1st. And today is the first day. Our reporters in three mobile studios and uh, are traveling through China's old industrial base in the northeast, the manufacturing powerhouse in the southeast, and also the emerging southwest region. Uh, the special series will explore the country's uh, natural beauty and also tremendous transformation that China has undergone over the past 70 years. Well, first, let me go to my colleagues uh, Tao Yuan and uh, Sean Caleb's in Zunyi. Uh, Zunyi is located in the southwestern province of Guizhou. Uh, my colleagues uh, Sean and Tao Yuan are going to tell us more about that city. So, hello guys. So, why do we start the whole new China trip? From Zunyi. Uh, Dong, Dong Ning, we will get right to that, but it's, it's a perfect place uh, to start. Really, it's so much of new China actually began right here. Welcome, everybody, to our ambitious uh, event that is going to unfold over the next 12 days. New China, our team of journalists, uh, will be crisscrossing the nation, uh, highlighting changes, challenges, programs, struggles as the People's Republic of China turns 70 years old. I'm Sean Caleb's. And I'm Tao Yuan. We actually have three teams of journalists, one heading to the northeast, one to the southeast, and Sean and I will be focusing on the rich history as well as the bright future of the southwest part of the country. Yeah, absolutely. It's a, exciting for us, and we're coming to you live from the historic city of Zunyi. It was here in uh, 1935, during the Zunyi Conference, that Mao Zedong took leadership of the Red Army. And behind us, in that restored uh, two-story building that you see uh, right there, really, he became the leader of modern-day China. Now, today, this site is a popular tourist venue, attracting about 4 million people each year. You can probably hear one of the leaders of the tour group talking to his guide. But here in the uh, uh, Guizhou region, it is characterized by its really rugged landscape, the beauty, the mountains that really surround us, the rivers here, very important, and you know those much better than I. Exactly. It's also known as one of China's most ethnically diverse part of the country. Now, over the next 12 days, we will make our way through much of the southwest to bring you stories of the new China, taking you high into the mountains and the massive bridges that span the chasm. While rich in beauty, the southwest has left behind much of the rest of the country in terms of the economics. But that's changing, and partly it's because of a huge campaign to completely eradicate poverty in China by the year of 2020, as well as an increased trade in the region and an influx of new industries such as big data. China has become the second largest economy in the world and boasts a massive middle class of hundreds of millions of people. And to think, it all started with a humble meeting right here in this building. Right here in Zunyi. And it's going to be excited as new China unfolds and we take you across the country. Really, the People's Republic of China uh, has experienced three major eras during the past 70 years. It implemented what's known as socialist reform during the new China era, leading to an area of socialist construction in 1978. China then started a new era of economic reform and opening up, building a socialist society with Chinese characteristics. Our reporter, Wang Wei, explains. The announcement by Chairman Mao signals a new era for China. After 28 years of war and under the leadership of the Communist Party of China, the country defeated the Japanese invaders, overturned the Kuomintang reactionaries, and brought about a new democratic revolution. The People's Republic of China was finally established on October 1, 1949. The establishment of the new China ended the fight against imperialism and feudalism in China, abolished unequal treaties imposed by imperialist countries, as well as their privileges in China. It was a great leap from years of feudal autocracy to democracy. In the next seven years, the new China accomplished a socialist transformation. 
The country formed the first People's Congress, drafted a constitution, and established the fundamental system of socialism. It basically set a political and institutional foundation for China's future development. From 1956 to 1978, China went through a period of socialist construction. China successfully tested its first atomic and hydrogen bombs and launched its first artificial satellite. It accomplished significant achievements, but its social and economic campaign, known as Great Leap Forward, failed to achieve favorable results. In 1978, China embraced a critical turning point. Chinese leader Deng Xiaoping started implementing economic reforms and opening up policy in the year. Focusing on economic development, China has been going through an all-round reform since then, striving towards building a socialist country with Chinese characteristics. At the conference to celebrate the 40 years of reform and opening up last year, Chinese President Xi Jinping stressed the policy's importance. China's opening up and economic reform is a great reform in the history of the Chinese nation's development. It is this great reform that pushed forward the great leap of socialism with Chinese characteristics. China is now the world's second largest economy and the largest manufacturing country. According to the Chinese government, between 1978 and 2018, the country's GDP climbed from 370 billion yuan or 52 billion US dollars to 83 trillion yuan or 12 trillion US dollars. It was increased by 223 times with an average annual growth rate of 9.5%. People's livelihood also improved remarkably. The number of people living in poverty was cut by 740 million, and the people's annual average disposable income per capita increased from 171 yuan or $24 to 26,000 yuan or $3,660. The country also made big progress in its democratic process. For People's Congress, we have increased the number of representatives from rural areas. The rate of representatives to the population they represent is equal between rural areas and urban areas. In the legal system, we have established the lifelong accountability system for judges to ensure that justice is administered. We have also abolished the rehabilitation through labor system. And China has also become more active on the international stage. It has been promoting the Belt and Road Initiative and aiming at building a community with a shared future for humanity. As the Chinese President Xi Jinping says, the country adheres to the leadership of the Communist Party of China the path of socialism with the Chinese characteristics, and the policy of opening up an economic reform. It strives to help people live better lives, contribute more, and dream big. Wang Hui, CGTN, Beijing. The Zunyi Conference was a critical meeting held by key leaders of the Communist Party of China during the country's long march. It wasn't this setting in Zunyi City that saw Mao Zedong rise as the leader of the Communist Party and the People's Liberation Army. Let's now take a look at this very meeting room, which held the, histo the, turning, the historical meeting uh, here in Zunyi. That's that building right there. A pivotal meeting took place here, which shaped the history of modern China. For three days in January 1935, the Communist Party of China or CPC, held its most critical meeting, known as the Zunyi Conference. It's named after Zunyi, now a city in the southwestern province of Guizhou. Twenty members gathered in this room to reflect and re-strategize their way forward, after having failed and lost thousands of troops in the Jiangxi region during the Long March. 
It was during this meeting that the party's erroneous strategy was corrected, and Mao Zedong solidified his leadership in the party and in the army. Mao's policy, which was closer to China's reality, was received at this meeting. Ultimately, the Red Army, or armed forces of the CPC, regained its military power and defeated the Kuomintang using a guerrilla strategy. This strategy was known for its flexible tactics, including ambushes and raids, to fight the larger and less agile military. Almost all of the furnishings in this room remain the same as they were 84 years ago: the cupboard, the table, parts of the chairs, even the clock. And now, looking back, it seems almost surreal that the very place that saw changes made and adopted that led to the CPC's victory in the war was in this congested but all-important meeting room, a victory that led to today's modern China. Well, to talk more about China's revolutionary history, we are now joined by Lei Guangren. He is the vice president of the Zuni Institute of Long March Studies. Hello, Mr. Lei. Thank you very much for joining us.、Welcome、I can't think、show. about something more important. We had a chance to look through some of the museum that,、mm. at the, just the antiquated weapons、mm. and medical supplies. What was it that was able to get all the soldiers to rally and go through the long march, knowing how difficult and painful it was going to be? 雷老师，我的同事尚安，他是在博物馆里面看到了很多红军当年用过的这种陈列品，他就很好奇，这么简陋的条件，简陋的医疗设备，简陋的武器，他想问您，这个红军，您认为是凭借什么支撑下来了这个两万五千里的长征？好的。This is the A Museum for Zuni Conference. So at the very beginning, actually, the Red Army didn't make a good start. So after the meeting here, it laid a solid foundation for the communist victory in the war. More than hundred and thousands Red Army. So what really supported them to achieve this great victory? I believe is their belief or their dream. Because back then it's the effort of decade and the bullying, so we have our dream to pursuing a better future. I believe these really support our Red Army. So after the conference here, so I believe the Red Army is so encouraged because they think Chairman Mao had all the strategies to win. The war. I believe Chairman Mao actually was very happy that we had a group of armies that they have the、A、strategies to make us go through all the hard times and finally win the victory. So this, I believe, is all the reasons why the、A、communist victory in the war. This is because of their right strategy. Thank you, Mr. Lei. My question for you is this. I think、uh, this site is still a major tourist attraction till this day. Each year, millions of visitors come here to learn about that part of the history. So, what do you think people go away with after visiting this place? How do you think the spirit of the Long March, the spirit of the Red Army, how do you think it's still affecting people today? 梅老师想问您一下，每年有几百万的游客来参观我们遵义，还有这个遵义会址。您认为这种长征精神对现代人还有哪些启发？这里。With time, going by, more and more people start to realize that this is a path to victory, and that actually you can find the golden key here. They would like to find out the secret behind this, the secret of a victory. We have more than four million visitors here every year. What they are looking for? V A. Big secret behind the victory. I believe that's the Chairman Mao's strategy to get the China to win the war. So we talk about how you win the war. There should be a technique, right? So the A the army coming to us, we should find their weakness point. We should start to find out when the time they made a mistake. Then that's our chance, right? So we basically have different strategies and also different ways. Tactics to win the war. I believe there are a lot of friends from home and abroad to find this Thank out. Thank you. That was Mr. Lei Guanghuan. He's the vice president of the Zunyi Institute of Long March Studies. Yeah, it's, 
And it's really amazing, uh, these stories that uh, people need to keep alive. If you think about modern-day China with such a 800 million uh, people growing in this giant middle class, mm. economic powerhouse, space flight, everything. And a lot of it, you have to think back 70 years ago, the lives of China's Red Army soldiers may have been sacrificed in the country's long march, but their legacy and their spirit live on. One soldier, Kang Xiaozhan, was also the first director of the Zhuni Meeting Memorial Museum and one of the earliest revolutionary memorial halls established after the founding of the People's Republic of China. CGTN's Weilin Tang caught up with Kong's granddaughter, Kong Xia, who does all she can to promote the Red Army spirit. It's been 31 years since Kong Xia's grandfather passed away. She was only 18 at the time. Kong Xianquan, or formerly known as Kong Quan, was one of the thousands of Red Army soldiers who fought in China's historic Long March. The 6,000-mile march saw the armed forces of the Communist Party of China eventually defeat the Kuomintang forces, resulting in the China that it is today, modern and peaceful. Kong Xianquan stayed back in Zunyi City, a crucial meeting point in the arduous march. And today, his spirit and the Red Armies live on in his granddaughter. In China, we have some people who believe in religion and others who don't. But I think for every Chinese, the spirit of our Long March and Red Army should be the belief that our patriots should hold fast to. I asked Kong Xia how she defines the Red Army spirit. First is to have a firm belief in ourselves. Secondly, to have a goal, be it in work or life. In any setbacks that we encounter, we must move forward firmly towards our goal. It is when we have faith that we can see hope and success in times of difficulty. We should not be afraid of hardship and loss. We should also not to lose sight of traditional virtues such as hard work and living plainly. Even when we live in wealth, we cannot waste. Kong Xia is now engaged in promoting rate cultural work and hopes to institutionalize rate culture activities. She finds meaning in teaching primary school children and training tour guides and lecturers. In the process of my job, I will share with others that the spirit of Long March and Red Army is to do the best we can, to not cause trouble for others, and to consider the needs of others. This is the greatest contribution to our society. I believe there are two long marches in everyone's heart, one that has been written into history by our revolutionary martyrs. While for us, who are still on our feet, it is to work towards how can we be the best version of ourselves. China is now the world's second largest economy. Its development is increasingly intertwined with that of international affairs. And it's for this reason that Kong Xia says China needs to learn more about and be inspired by the history of the Long March and Red Army. I feel very honored to be born in this flourishing generation, where I can witness the development of our country. When I was a child, my family was very poor. At that point in time, I did not think I could have what I have today. As what General Secretary Xi Jinping said, we have to strive for happiness. China today has become strong, but in the process of these scientific and technological developments are contributions made by each individual laborer. So the change in China today is not because of one person, it's because of the efforts of billions of Chinese over generations. It's these values of hard work, humility, and never forgetting where you came from, that Kong Xia hopes to continue paying forward for many more generations in China to come. Wei Lin Tang, CGTN, Zunyi City in Guizhou Province. Well, like we said before, we've actually got three teams of journalists on our special coverage, New China, 70 years on. Now, Sean, should we check in now with our colleagues up north? In yeah, the let's find out. We had a little Jeff. bit of rain here, but we know it gets cold up it there. It gets cold we up there. We saw some jackets, so let's... And our colleagues Jeff Moody and Cui Hui Ao are actually in Manzhou Li. Hello, Jeff and Hui Ao. What's going on on your end? Hello. Hello. Well, everybody here is complaining that it's cold, but it's just like a British summer for me, so I'm absolutely <laughs> fine. I think it's lovely. Well, uh, following the 
October Revolution, a group of Chinese intellectuals developed preliminary communist ideas and wanted to learn about Marxism. And Manzhou Li was where many of the founding leaders of the CPC sneaked into the Soviet Union, which is literally just over there. That was during the Japanese occupation of China. During that time, military police, secret agents were everywhere along the Sino-Soviet border. The revolutionary comrades were at the risk of detection or arrest. And Manzhou Li was, uh, uh, it became this secret passageway between Moscow and Beijing. So compared with by ship, this rail route through Harbin, Manchuria to Moscow certainly saves time and money, and it's relatively safe for comrades. Indeed, and the strategic location makes Manjoli a crucial hub on this red road. Uh, it has strengthened the ties with Communist International and led to the rapid development of the Communist Party of China. In fact, in June 1928, we know the sixth National Congress of CPC was held in Moscow. Uh, it was the only historic meeting in the history of the CPC that was held abroad, and a crucial one at a time when the Chinese revolutionaries uh, was in crisis. And for more on this, we are now joined by our Professor Li Yo, Senior Fellow from China's Association of International Trade. So thank you so much, Professor Li, for joining us. My question to you is, if we're looking back to the history, what do you think is the role of the city of Manzhou Li in leading the development of CPC? I think you know, this is really part of the uh, important building block of the Communist Party as it is today. And that happened you know, during, the, you know, after the failure of the first great revolution that the Communist Party sought to take independent leadership of the revolution in China. Mm -hmm. And as you mentioned earlier, that was the time when the wet uh, terror was rampant, mm -hmm. and there was a kind of a crackdown on the Communist Party's activities. And there, uh, there, were, there was no safe place for them to hold this party congress. And therefore, Moscow was chosen. And there was another reason, you know, the Communist Party wanted to seek guidance from Communist International. Mm. And there were three re actually important re uh, decisions made by the, in the conference. One is you know, the uh, recognition of the nature of the society, which is basically sem semi-colonial, semi-feudal. You know, that is very important in terms of determining the role of the Communist Party. The other thing is to determine the general task of the Communist Party, which is not really to organize uprising, but win the support of the people. And today, Manjoli associate themselves dearly with that part of the history. So they replicated the conference location, you know, the bit, rebuilt the house, and it has become part of the city's gene. Mm -hmm. So it is also the part of their effort to develop the city into a tourist trading center. And that tourist tourism is red tourism, and that will allow people to come over here to have a feel to experience, you know, what has happened. Exactly. In so, the past. like you said, there's always going to be this red memory of this city, exactly. right, Jeff? Yeah, absolutely. Fascinating that it's not just a, a border town where people can go and buy their goods and, and cross over to Russia, but it's played such a historic role exactly. in the development of modern yes. China. Well, that's it from us for now. We're going to head back into the bus and head on to our next destination, maybe even some lunch if we're lucky. Let's go back to the southeast. Sean Caleb, so how are you getting on down there? <laughs> Ah, uh, very well. We could hear the wind whipping up there as you guys were on the border. We're down here in the very humid mountains. Uh, thanks, Jeff and Wei Ao. Uh, let's see, we have been to the northeast. We've covered yeah. the southwest. We have three groups. What are we well, missing? Well, we've got the rain. We've got the cold. It's a good thing that at least one of our groups is, is enjoying sunny weather. I believe our colleagues Michelle Vandenberg and Li Jianhua are covering the country's southeast. Let's go live to them. That's right. Well, it's actually really humid and hot here. I'm not sure if that's something we like. So we are on the bus touring Nining 
uh, city, the capital of Guangxi, Zhuang Autonomous Region. Now, Guangxi is quite active uh, during the Chinese Civil War back in the 1920s and 30s, and case in point was the Baisa Uprising in 1929. That's right, talking about the Baisa Uprising, it happened in a small city, nearly three hours' drive from the city we're in right now. So basically, it was successful military insurrection uh, back then, led by the Chinese Communist Party. Yes, and then for more on that, on that, we're now joined by Andy Mark. He's the senior fellow at the Center for China and Globalization, and Han Hua, uh, the president of Beijing Belt and Road uh, Cooperative Community. Welcome, and thank you for being with us for the next four days. So, Andy, let's start with you. Let's first tell us a little bit more uh, of the background of this Baisa uprising. Sure. Well, this Baisa uprising really took place in the context of a multi-decade military conflict that was the Chinese Civil War. And it officially started on uh, August 1st, 1927 in Nanchang with the so-called Nanchang Uprising. But two years later, of course, here we are, well, in Guangxi, uh, two years later, there was a similar uprising as well. And the best way, I think, to understand this was that this was, uh, you know, a 20-year civil war between the Kuomintang, or the Nationalists, and the Chinese Communist Party. And against all odds, uh, the CPC won, and of course went on to establish uh, the People's Republic of China in 1949. Yeah, what a history this is, isn't it? It's very much yeah. like a mini classroom for history. So how about the uh, significance of this uh, uprising back then? Well, Baisa uprising happened in a very transitional point. Before that, it was Nanchang uprising, Qiushou uprising, Guangzhou uprising, where it is either uh, they are either the uh, city oriented uh, mm -hmm. uprising or the village or rural areas oriented yeah. uprising. Where in Baisa, actually, it was Deng Xiaoping, uh, one of the founding fathers of New China, who came to Guangxi and set up a team actually in Nanning, here in the yeah. city, but he later decided to have this uprising in the rural area. So it's he combined, successfully combined the team set up in the city, but then still decided to have the uprising in the rural areas where the Communist Party have a more solid base and the, communi the Communist message was conveyed better to those peasants, farmers in Baise area. So it laid a foundation for this combination of the city and the village oriented uprising and put them together. It was very creative at that time. So mm -hmm. that was uh, you know, put Baise uprising in a very mm -hmm. unique position during mm -hmm. the civil war. So that is very much like the mm -hmm. Baise uprising with the threshold of the uprising in China back then, right? So that's all for us. Back to you, Sean and Yuan. and Li Jianhua covering the southeast route of our special coverage, New China, 70 years on. Now, during China's long march, the Red Army soldiers crossed the Chishui River four different times and managed to dodge a Kuomintang blockade. Aside from its role in the historic march, the river also holds a key recipe in the making of China's most famous liquor, the Mao Tai Bai Jiu. It said that the liquor was used to sterilize wounds of the soldiers as they stumbled into Mao Tai Town during the Long March. Now, in a fast-changing environment today, the ancient craftsmanship of producing Mao Tai is still being practiced. Let's take a look. Driving into Mao Tai Town, one of the first things you're struck with is the soy, saucy, fermented liquor in the air. That's the smell of Mao Tai, a brand of China's most famous liquor, Bai Jiu translated as white liquor. And this quaint, alluring town in Guizhou province is home to one of the world's best-known liquor companies, Guizhou Mao Tai. The Chishui River is Mao Tai's life, was once one of the company's slogans. Water from the protected Chishui River is the only liquid used in making Mao Tai. The other ingredients include locally grown and steamed red sorghum, and a fermentation starter known as Chu. This mixture goes through an open-air stacking fermentation and a pit fermentation in an enclosed space. It is distilled nine times. The distilled liquor is then filtrated 
or gathered seven times at a high temperature. Each production cycle takes one year. Most of our traditional operations are done manually by hand. Unlike other liquor companies, where automation makes up a big part of their production, our liquor must be stored for a long time. From the time production is underway until the bottle is out of the factory, it takes at least five years. This may not be the case for other liquors. The distilled baijiu is stored for up to four years in pottery jars. Both during and after the storage period, the liquor will go through an elaborate blending process. Once the blending is done, various quality tests are done before final products are packed. From bottle washing to filling the liquor, to capping to labeling, to the tying of red ribbons around the bottle's necks, then finally cold spraying and encasement. All in, it takes 30 processes, 165 steps, a piece of Chinese culture in this wide and red bottle. In China, Mao Tai is much more than just a fiery drink. It really is a cultural symbol that has graced the table of many state leaders visiting the nation. And back in 1949, Mao Tai was served at the founding of the People's Republic of China. Now, just two years later, Kwai Chao Mao Tai, a merger of three distillers, was established. For more, let's join our reporter, Wei Lin Tang, who did that last story for us, and she's at the production site right now. Wei Lin, it must be a treat for you to be able to see how uh, this is actually made. And, uh, and, and also talk about its importance to this region. Well, hello, Tushan. It's definitely a treat being here, being able to see how Mao Tai is produced and packaged. Guizhou Mao Tai is, after all, one of the world's most valuable liquor companies, if not the most valuable in terms of market capitalization. In the last two years, its shares on the Shanghai Stock Exchange has more than doubled, giving it a market value of 1.4 trillion yuan or 200 billion US dollars. Now, despite the um, attention from investors worldwide, much of Guizhou's uh, Mao Tai sales are actually still domestically driven, and the company is looking to address this. And for more on the company's global expansion plans, I'm very pleased to be joined by Mr. Wang Yan, who is the Deputy Party Secretary of Guizhou Mao Tai Group, the parent company of the Shanghai listed firm. Mr. Wang, thank you for joining us on this program. Wang Shuxi, thank you for having us. Hello, thank you so for having me. So in the first me. half of 2019, exports accounted for 5% of the company's total sales, um, right? But the company plans to up this to 10%. How does it plan to achieve that? Right. So coming to our today's result, we now talk about the medium and long-term goal, which is to create Mao Tai, a world-class brand. So we would like to make our group into the leading level around the world. Without a marching, a matching influence in the global market, no need to talk about a world-class level. So we would like to achieve this goal in the following three aspects. First, accelerate the global layout. Especially, we would like to expand our efforts in developing in the emerging markets and potential markets, and also further cultivate mainstream consumers in the European and American markets, and also increase investment and constructions in emerging markets such as Africa and South Africa, South America. And the second is to actively respond to the ABL and Road Initiative and make them as our new focus for the multi international market, and also would like to conduct some more exchanges and the cooperation with different cultures so people understand more about China and also our Chinese culture and the Chinese liquors. So we work really hard in this regards to conduct the international exchanges. Right. But right here at your home, uh, home turf, though, I mean, China's economy is slowing. And judging by the demand for Mao Tai liquor, as well as the price that consumers are willing to pay, it doesn't seem like Guizhou Mao Tai is feeling the consumption pinch. Um, what's your assessment of the China's in the consumption market? Wang Shuxi said,就现在中国的这个经济增长速度就缓慢了。那说一下未来这个您对这个中国消费市场这一个这个期待，还有这个潜能。my personal understanding is we already experienced the a reform and opening up in the past four years. We create a 
magic. Right now, it's still slowed down a little bit, but still, it's a sound growth rate. We create a quite good life for our people. So look at our Chinese consumers. They not really limit themselves to the day to day consumptions. They really pursue a high end, really high quality products. So, this is actually the strength of our multi liquor. I believe we have a bright future. I'm also quite strong and a big believer in China's right. consumer so market. So China's consumption upgrade is a good thing for Guizhou Maotai. Now, uh, Wang Shuxi, we are now here at um, you know your packaging line right now. Could you tell us some of the intricacies of your packaging process? Show us Wang Shuxi in this packaging all right, right now you are looking at that this is our factory for packaging. So look at our packaging, it's including four major process, bottle washing, canning, bottle packaging and packing. And this is a quite unique component. So look at the a loading bottles, labeling, and the tiny ribbons. So this is quite our unique way of the tiny ribbons. You look at it, they are really the technique. They really depend on long-term efforts and hard work. So you look at all these women workers. If we have time, I would like my cameraman to just pan to one of the ladies tying the ribbons. So I was told that you know one of the I mean each lady here can tie up to three thousand ribbons on the necks of the bottles in one shift. That's six hours. So that makes it one ribbon per bottle. You know in eight seconds. Amazing. 好，谢谢王书记今天的接受我们采访。Thank you. Thank you. And that's it from us. Back to you, Sean and Tao Yuan. That was our reporter Wei Lin. I don't know about you, Sean. I can almost smell the spirit from across the screen. We're going to have to check her carry-on bag when she gets to the bus. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, that was our reporter, Wei Ling Tang, reporting for us. But for more on the development of the old revolutionary area, we're actually now joined by Mr. V v Victor Gao Zhikai uh, with uh, the Center for China and Globalization, as well as the chairman for China's Energy Security Institute, and Mr. Chen Jiahe. He's the chief strategist with Sinda Securities. Welcome again, guys. Thank you for having me. So, Mr. Gao, let me start with you. So, we're at the Zhuying conference site. We did a tour of this very site yesterday. We also visited the museum. I mean, just looking at some of the items on display, I think it's really like traveling back in time to a time when you know, the founding of the PRC, the founding of the People's Republic of China was only a distant dream. But I look at the country today, I mean, the transformation that we've gone through, I think it's hard to imagine that what we have today, what we enjoy today, actually come from a group of ragtag peasant soldiers. Absolutely. By 1935, when the Red Army reached the Zheng Yi, they were already on the verge of being annihilated. Mm. They were encircled again and again. And around the Zheng Yi, there were hundreds of thousands of nationalist troops. Mm. And I think uh, the Red Army didn't have much uh, weaponry to start with. And their material and the medical supply were running out. So nobody really believed that the Red Army would survive these multiple rounds of encirclements. Mm. And I think it's really thanks to their dedication and sheer commitment to the communist cause uh, that they uh, cherished in mind. And also, they had nowhere to go back to. They had only one way to go, that is continue to push forward, to reach whatever destination that eventually Mao Zedong and other Chinese leaders would designate it for them. So I think it was truly a mission impossible. And I think to be here and to see the Zheng Yi conference venue with our own eyes, we are really shocked again as to how many odds that the Red Army need to overcome and uh, uh, really persevere in whatever they believe in to make sure that they not only survive but also prosper eventually through wars after war and eventually uh, they contributed so much to the founding of the People's Republic of China in 1949. And such a humble start, too. And Mr. Chen, uh, pick it up here a, a bit. Zuni's place in history is set. People are always going to be talking about this now that that building has been restored. This uh, museum has been uh, open for years and years now. But let's talk about where Guizhou province is going, because it is bucking a trend uh, that is really kind of halting the whole globe right now. Its finances, its economy is moving 
upward in a positive direction. Uh, hasn't felt the bite that other areas have from the prolonged trade war with the United States. Tell me what you think about the economic future for this area and, and why is it doing well? If you look at the history, Guizhou is not a good place for economics. Um, it hasn't got a close distance to the ocean. It's very far away from the ocean, like Guangdong province. It has got no river, no large river. And it's got so many mountains that you can see around. So it's not a good place for developing economy at all. Its traditional economy are concentrating on food, such as Mao Tai, uh, Lao Gamma, it's a flavor. Uh, and mining, these kind of things. But now China is doing exactly two things. The first is building a lot of railroad into Guizhou. That's actually increasing the transportation cap capacity of the province. The second is that it's bringing a lot of digital industry into the province because that does not um, have to be close to the ocean or whatever. So these things are really changing Guizhou. Mm, just to pick up from where Mr. Chen left off, Bridges, roads, also tech industry. I think Apple last year opened their first data center in Asia, right in this province. Other tech giants, Alibaba, Amazon, local ones, homebrew ones, um, Huawei, uh, Tencent, they all have their data centers here in Guizhou. Mr. Gao, what do you think the draw of this province is? Because, I mean, traditionally, it's one of the poorest ones in China. Absolutely. Uh, Guizhou is known for its mountainous uh, terrain and uh, it doesn't have much flat land to start with. And uh, traditionally, it was very much landlocked. And uh, doing all kinds of uh, manufacturing industries, for example, is very, very difficult. However, I think, uh, as the other panelists that just now mentioned, building up connectivity, highways and uh, hi uh, railways, for example, really helps. And secondly, I think the provincial government really set their eye on the uh, new wave of internet, for example, cloud and uh, storage, for example, data storage. And this is really emancipating the productivity of this province. All of a sudden, Guizhou has realized that it does have advantages because it has many rivers coming right. through the uh, province and they develop hydropower very aggressively. And power in this province is very cheap compared with other provinces. So I think it is really taking advantage of uh, 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 special features of its terrain, of this province, and now they are turning all these situations to their advantage. Oh, wow. Mr. Chen, the Long March made its way through here, obviously. What is it going to take? How do you feel about the future in terms of continuing this positive uh, blip of growth that it has now because there's a lot of competition out there for jobs. The new Long March, we could call it. Yeah, the new economic Long March. But I think it's a really positive place for Guizhou because if you look at the economic development level of Guizhou at this moment, it's much, much better than it was before. I mean, the trading uh, value is about 500 times uh, more than what was there in 1978. But it's still one of the poorest uh, regions in China. It's got a very low ground for economic development. That means you've got a huge potential potential. Uh, if you look at the data, that actually proves the potential. The GDP growth rate of Guizhou province reached 9.3 last year, which is much higher than the average of nation. The trade has been increasing at around 18% annual rate in the past few years, so that's much higher than the nation. So you can get proved by all these data. Another advantage is that Guizhou is actually pretty close to Asian countries, linked by railroad, which is now under construction. When these roads are constructed, because if you look at Asian countries, they are like the Guizhou of the world. I mean, they are much poorer compared with the United States. They are like Guizhou in the United States in Shanghai. So they also got a huge potential for development. So linking these regions will give you a great economic picture in the future. Wow. Perfect, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. So, um, okay. Sean, there's actually a Chinese saying which goes, if you want to be rich, you got to build roads, right? <laughs> that makes sense. Well, that's why traditionally Guizhou province and some of the surrounding mountainous provinces in China's southwest used to be poor. It's because of the mountainous road condition. So I tell you, traveling in this part of the country used to be tough because uh, Guizhou province has some of China's uh, most beautiful mountains and valleys, but it's um, a geological condition have also made it difficult for people to get around. I think it's still, the situation is still true right now uh, to some extent. But to tackle this, the Southwest province has built bridges and one bridge has found itself a name, the highest bridge in the world. Let's take a look. Connecting the borders of Guizhou and Yunnan to mountainous provinces in Southwest China. Beipanjiang Bridge, the world's highest bridge, 
opened to traffic on December 29, 2016. The bridge to exceeds 565 meters, or 1,854 feet above ground, or in this case, the Beipan River, which the bridge is named after. That's as high as a 200-floor building. Meanwhile, the four-lane roadway bridge spans 1,341 meters in length. People now spend just on over an hour traveling from Liu Panshui City in Guizhou to Xuanwei City in Yunnan, compared to a more than four-hour drive previously. The Steel Trust Cable State Suspension Bridge has a main span of 720 meters, currently the second longest in the world. The bridge took the lead in adopting the 500 megapascal high-strength steel bars in its design most commonly used in developed countries such as Europe and the U.S. Its consumption of 126,000 tons of steel has resulted in cost and energy savings as well as emissions reduction. The Beipanjiang Bridge cost 1.03 billion yuan, or over 140 million U.S. dollars, to build. In May of 2018, it won the Gustav Lindenthal Medal, dubbed the Nobel Prize of Bridges at the 35th International Bridge Conference. Four months later, it was certified by the Guinness World Records. Now for my co-host, uh, we'd like to thank you all for being here and joining us and our crew. That does it for today's New China 1200 show. So back to you, Dong Ning. Thank you very much indeed, Sean and Tao Yuan in China's uh, southwest uh, Guizhou province and also uh, my colleagues on the routes in China's northeast Jeff and Tuhuiao and southeast region Michelle and Li Jianhua, thank you very much. Uh, tomorrow at 4 GMT, noon Beijing time, our reporters in New China will continue to hit the road and bring you the beautiful scenery in Hulunbear grassland in China's Inner Mongolia. So stay with us for all that.